Hey, ladies and gentlemen, according to my watch, it is 5 p.m. right now, and I have the chance to welcome you or <laughs> welcome you again, depending on <laughs> whether you have been here an hour ago or not. Uh, some of us have, some of us haven't. There uh, has been a mix up in our times and our time uh, frames and time plans. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to start over, but some of our guests have already listen, listened to Francisca Arnold Dwyer talking about the um, UK insurance regulatory regime post-Brexit. Um, that is why we are going to um, change the order of appearance, and that's why my welcome address is might sound a little bit rehearsed because I've already said that before. So, so I do apologize for the uh, for the time mix up. Um, we're a little bit lost in time uh, uh, today. So again, welcome. Uh, we are happy to have you with us today. And we are glad that you're joining us for another transatlantic lecture on insurance law. The topic today from Vienna via London to Vegas, a whistle-stop tour of current issues in insurance law. Um, as I've already said, it's not from Vienna via London to Vegas now, it is from Vienna via Vegas to London, uh, because Jeff uh, Stempel is going to talk, he's going to give his presentation before Francisca that does the same thing. Um, I would like to pass the microphone to Oliver William then, and he's going to uh, moderate um, the rest of today's um, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Um, I have the honor to welcome everyone, some of you again, and to introduce to you our fabulous panelists of tonight. Um, we we'll start with Ms. Manuela Zimmerman, who works as a partner at the renowned law firm of Schönherr in Austria. Ms. Zimmerman is a dual qualified lawyer. She's admitted to practice law in Germany as well as in Austria. She is a specialist solicitor for insurance law in Germany, and she is a lecturer for insurance law at the Vienna University of Economics and business. Ms. Zimmerman will talk about group insurance in the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, insurance intermediation law, insurance contract law, and private international law. After Ms. Zimmerman's talk, we will have Helmut Heiss, who does not need to be introduced. He is well known. Um, you all know him. He is one of the initiators of the Attila Lecture. So I will just mention a few facts about him. One is that he holds the chair of private law, private comparative law and private international law at the University of Zurich. He is the co-chair of the special interest group of ins insurance law of the European Law Institute. He's the chairman of the global research project group Principles of Reinsurance Contract Law, and he was the chairman of the research project group Restatement of European Insurance Law. He is also a counsel at MBH Attorneys at Law in Zurich, and I believe it's fair to say that he is one of the most renowned experts in insurance law in Europe and beyond. And just as Ms. Zimmerman Helmut will also talk about group insurance um, in the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. After Helmut, we will have a presentation by Jeffrey Stemple. Those of you who have followed the Attila lectures, who are regulars, have had the privilege to listen and watch a couple of very interesting presentations by Professor Stemple. He is um, Doris S. and Theodore B. Lee Professor of Law at the University of Nevada, William S. Boyd Law School. Previously, he served on the faculty of Brooklyn Law School and Florida State University College of Law. He is an expert in civil procedure, in legal ethics, 
in alternative dispute resolution and for us most notably in insurance law. He authored countless books, treatise chapters, as well as law review articles on numerous insurance law topics. Professor Stemple is a member of the American Law Institute, as well as of the Principles Drafting Committee in the Research Project Principles of Reinsurance Contract Law. Professor Stemple, um, in numerous instances, brilliantly added the North American perspective to our discussions about insurance law, and we're delighted that he's going to do that today or tonight again. Jeff will speak about fissures and fault lines in US insurance law, dual systems, divergent outcomes, and cautionary concerns for the EU. At the end, or after Jeff's talk, we will have Francisca Arnold Dwyer, who is going to um, talk or give her presentation again. She is probably known by most of you, um, a lecturer, a senior lecturer in insurance law and contract law and in sustainability at Queen Mary University of London. She is the director of the Insurance, Shipping and Aviation Law Institute at Said University. And she's also the director of the Insurance Law LLM program at Queen Mary University. Francisca has authored and edited numerous books in the field of insurance law, most notably one entitled Insurable Interest and the Law. There is another very interesting one coming up very soon. It is entitled Insurance, Climate Change and the Law, and it will be published in 2024. So I look um, very much forward to that. She has assisted the Law Commission, the English one and the Scottish one, with their insurable interest reform project. She is a regular speaker at insurance industry events and a valued member of the Principles Drafting Committee of the research group Principles of Reinsurance Contract Law. Before switching sides to academia, Francisca practiced law in the litigation and dispute resolution department at Clifford Chance. Francisca Arnold Dwyer will speak about the UK insurance regul regulatory regime post Brexit and ask the question Quo Vadis. So that was the introduction, and I would like to pass over the word to Manuela Zimmerman. Thank you very much for the very warm welcome. I would like to share my presentation with you. I hope you all can see the presentation. I will present you a very important decision of the ECG from last September, from September last year. And this decision is, let's say, one of the most important for group insurance cases, the facts of the case. TC Medical and Trust advertising companies to offer consumers membership um, in a collective insurance in return for a fee. TC Medical subscribed to a group insurance policy with the insurer W. The insurance company gave coverage in the event of sickness or accident abroad. TC Medical acts as policyholder, which means he paid the premiums to the insurer. Additionally, TC Medical had a contractual relationship to a company which provides benefits consisting of organizing and carrying out repatriation in the event of sickness or accident abroad and organized a kind of call center. For the customers of TC Medical who have joined the group insurance, subscribe to it by making a payment and obtained various insurance benefits. The purpose of the activity of TC Medical was not to conclude an insurance contract, but to enable consumers to join this group insurance policy and to have the opportunity to receive the benefits covered by the insurance company. Neither TC Medical nor the advertising companies hold a license to provide to a license provided uh, under national law to carry out the activity of insurance mediation. Considering that fact that TC Medical 
corresponds to that of a kind of insurance intermediary and must be subject to have such a license, the regional court in Germany asked the ECG the following question. Is an undertaking which maintains as policyholder foreign travel medical insurance as a group insurance policy for its customers with an insurance undertaking distributes to customers memberships and entitling them to claim insurance benefits and receives a fee from the recruited members for this insurance cover and insurance intermediary within the meaning of the Directive 2002-92 and the Directive 2016-97. Before giving you the answer of the ECG to this question, let's have a short look to the definitions by the Directive 2016-97. There are a lot of the, um, the most interesting words of the answer of the ECG were defined in the Directive. So, the directive says various types of persons or institutions can distribute insurance products. It further days, says that consumers should benefit from the same level of protection despite the difference between the distribution channels. It also defines what is insurance distribution. This means the activity of advising on, proposing, or carrying out other work preparatory to the conclusion of insurance contracts. And the directive also defines what an insurance intermediary is. Intermediary is. So this means any natural or legal person who for remuneration takes up or pursues the activity of insurance distribution. And it also defines the remuneration, which means any commission, fee, charge, or other payment, including an economic benefit of any kind or any other financial or non-financial advantage or incentives given in respect of the insurance distribution activities. With these definitions, the ECG said, yes, a natural or legal person who maintains foreign travel medical insurance and insurance cover as a group insurance for its customers with an insurance undertaking distributes to this person's memberships and who receives from the recruited members a fee for the insurance cover purchase is an insurance intermediary in the meaning of this directives. The ECG considered the fact that the policyholder received a fee as relevant as a relevant criteria for the qualification as an intermediary. So this means a financial advantage is necessary for this qualification. And as we heard already, the financial advantage can be a lot a commission, a fee, or also financial and non-financial advantages. And the ECG also refers in his decision to the economic interest of its own, of the policyholder. This leads to the first conclusion that the activity enabling third parties to obtain insurance cover as a result of enrollment in group insurance and where the policyholder receives a remuneration and thus has an own economic interest, falls within the concept of insurance distribution. In that case, the policyholder will be qualified as insurance distributor. This has the result that the insurer on his side has to communicate the contractual information to the policyholder in a clear, accurate, and intelligible manner for consumers, with a view to subsequent transmission to consumers during the procedure for accession to the group contract. 
the policyholder must communicate that contractual information to any consumer before the consumer exceeds to that contract. That means that all the consumer of a group insurance contract must always have the, op the opportunity before the enrollment to the contract to become all the information and terms of the contract. This leads to the second or my second conclusion. In this case, in cases of individual and voluntary enrollment in group insurance, where the policyholder forwards the premium he receives from the person insured one-to-one -to, -one to the insurance company and has no financial advantage at all, the policyholder might not be qualified as an insurance distributor as he has no own economic interest. What for implications does this decision have? In case the policyholder of a group insurance contract is qualified as an intermediary, it leads to several legal issues. First, the intermediary must be registered. In case an insurer uses a non-registered intermediary, this might have not only supervisory, but also contractual consequences. For example, in Austria, the insurer would not be allowed to charge any acquisitions costs toward the person insured in the contract. Um, in case of misleading or missing advice towards the person insured, the question arises who will be liable, the policyholder or the insurer or both? And the Follow-up question is, in which function acts the policyholder? Is it a broker, an agent? This is not clear for the moment. So the decision brought some clearance, but also a lot of new questions arise. Thank you very much. And I will give over to the same topic to Helmut now. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation that um, has given the major overview on this late the case law of the European Court of Justice on group insurances, and which has really clarified or half clarified, I take it from your um, lecture, uh, the issue of whether the policyholder can be considered as to be a um, insurance intermediary. Once the European Court of Justice has done that, you have a lot of follow-up questions that are dealing with insurance contract law and also private international law of insurance, because if the policyholder is functionally to be treated as an intermediary, then it's intermediating a contract between the insurer and whom the individual insured, obviously, of a group insurance. And then this group, the individual group member is treated like a policyholder. And this is exactly the point that um, I would like to follow up with um, after uh, Manuela's presentation, and I would like to demonstrate this here in this uh, second slide. Um, you have an insurer. Formally, this insurer gets into an insurance contract with a policyholder who acts formally as a policyholder. But in fact, there is an agency agreement between the two of them, because the role of the policyholder is to bring in group members who, um, in the formal contractual point of from a formal contractual point of view uh, operate as insureds um, <clears throat> but from a functional point of view act like policyholders because ultimately they will pay the premium and uh, ultimately they will have to do a contractual choice which is either take out the insurance by exceeding the group or staying out and this is no other choice than any other policyholder has to take when either taking out insurance or not. And um, this way, uh, the insured is very much in an economic situation as though it was a policyholder. And um, 
when the ECJ did in the case C 63320, what Manuela has described, qualifying or classifying the um, policyholder as an agent, it's only a follow up consequence that it would qualify the insured as a um, policyholder. And that has a certain effect because um, the policyholder in all these cases is usually a commercial undertaking and having a commercial interest in, in bringing in group members. So they are not consumers. And so as far as the relation, contractual relationship between the insurer and those policyholders is concerned, no consumer insurance law should apply between those two parties. However, if you bring in the individual insured and uh, put him in a position like a policyholder, you will treat him like any consumer who has taken out a, a consumer policy in its own name. And this is exactly what happens because uh, the European Court of Justice in its follow-up judgment says that between the insured and the, the group member and the insurer, there is an individual insurance contract. And there would be more or less two insurance contracts one with the policy holder and the one individual insurance contract with the individual insured. I don't think this is technically right from a contractual point of view. I would rather think you would treat the group insurance with the policy holder as like a framework contract within which the accession to the group of each individual member will be classified as an individual insurance contract, but this way you end up in a, to, with a result that you have individual rights of the individual insurance. They are treated to be consumer and consumer law will apply. And if you look at the case law, and I, for some reason, jumped over this slide, they were all actually concerned with consumer, EU consumer law and its application. Um, the first case was dealing with unfair contract terms, the second one with the unfair B2C commercial practices, and this is the third one with this same uh, directive. So it's all consumer directives that you can only apply if the buyer of the insurance is a consumer. And this classification would only apply to the individual group members if you functionally treat them as policyholders. If you would exclusively look at the relationship between the formal policyholder, the group organizer, and the insurer, you would never apply consumer law because they are all commercial entities. So this is a, a construction that leads to a very important result that you have an individual contractual relationship between insurers and the insurers under a group insurance and you would apply all the consumer law that is attached to this. And this raises follow-up questions like, how is the insurer, for instance, uh, giving the information that it owes to each individual policyholder, which is now the individual group member and insured. And the court is addressing this subject uh, at several points. It says that this information material must be produced in a manner that it is um, possible to hand it out to the individual group member. It means that it has to be appropriate for an individual consumer in the end. And this is being handed out to the policyholder acting as an agent and acting as an agent, it is forwarded to the individual group member and thus to the insured. The policyholder, since it is an agent, would have to add all the uh, information to this, which stem from the IDD uh, and pass on both um, information papers. The second information paper, fulfilling the um, the obligations under the insurance distribution directive would, of course, be fulfilled in its own name and the policyholder agent would be liable for any failure. But the information material under Article 185, Solvency 2, that's an obligation for the insurer and he fulfills it as an agent. So there would be a liability of the insurer for any failure of the agent. At least this is how I understand these cases. And that is, of course, a, a result that has not been expected as long as the uh, court did not treat policyholders as agents. Now, you could say, well, this is a very important effect in contract law, but probably uh, since this is an EU case law now, it's not so important after all because we have very little European 
insurance contract law. Most of it is somehow regulatory supervisory law, but there is quite some contract law. We have the information duties just mentioned. We have a right of cancellation in life insurance contracts, and then we have contractual rules in the directive on distance marketing of consumer financial services. And we have again, the regulation on package retail in investment and in insurance based investment products. And they have also uh, private legal rules, a liability rule, for instance. And um, if you say, well, but that's it, there's no more European insurance contract law, I say yes. But uh, in all of national insurance contract law, the judgments of the ECJ will not be binding, but they will still be persuasive. And there's a high likelihood that the national courts will follow the same way of reasoning as the Court of Justice of the European Union has applied it or developed it in cases subject to national insurance contract law, simply because if you read those cases, all the argumentation is not flowing from some specifics of EU law. They are rather flowing from a, the C -C -C CGAU's understanding of insurance and how it works and what a group insurance is and how a group insurance is structured. And by doing so, the court actually reaches a, a result that is very similar to what the project group on principles of European insurance contract law has proposed in 2016. Those principles contain a separate chapter on group insurances, and they divide between automatic and elective group insurance. And elective group insurance would be the one where the group members have a choice to either join the group and then also pay the premium, similar to a policyholder taking out an, in, in, an individual insurance contract. And um, so what are the practical saying in this situation is say we will treat the group insurance arrangement with the group organizer as a framework contract, not as an insurance contract. And then by individual accession, we will have individual insurance contracts between insurers and their insurance. And this is very much in line with uh, the uh, CGAU, even though the approach um, is a little bit broader um, than taken by the European Court of Justice. And if you bring this problem a bit further and you look into areas where there's more EU sources of law, you're in the in the middle of uh, private international law and there's mainly three rules or sets of rules to be considered. First of all, the Solvency II regulation on insurance has two information duties which oblige an insurer to give an information on the law applicable uh, to, the, to the insurance contract. And of course, you may raise the question, would that now be also an information duty to be fulfilled vis-a-vis uh, -vis the individual insured? The second set of rules are the jurisdiction rules contained in the Brussels IBIS regulation. And uh, the question there would be, do we treat a insured in a group insurance like a policyholder under the rules of Brussels IEBs as well, just as much as the court has done that with the IDD. And finally, we have a special provision on the law applicable to insurance contracts, Article 7 of the Rome 1 regulation. And again, the question must be asked, if it's a group insurance of the kind uh, the EZJ has dealt with, would we treat a, an individual insured on a group insurance like a policyholder and apply Article 7 uh, in the light of this uh, classification of a group insurance arrangement. And I would suggest the following view in this to, to those questions. First of all, these information duties on the law applicable are just information duties as any other ones that the ECJ has already dealt with. And the ECJ has said, yes, the insurer is under obligation in those types of group insurances to file the document in a way that it is can be handed out to a consumer. And then it has to present it to the policyholder who acts as an agent. And in his role as an agent, he would forward it to the individual insured. So the case law in this respect is directly applicable and this information duties on conflict of law issues will be governed by the case law, which for me, no doubt, exists to that. When it comes to rules on jurisdiction, I think 
the world is upside down. You remember that what Manuela has said, she has explained that only for specific types of group insurances, the, uh, the policyholder will be dealt with like an agent or another intermediary. And this is, means only in those types of insurances, the ECJ will treat the insured as a policyholder. When it comes to jurisdiction rules and you read those rules in the Brussels IBIS regulation, you will see that throughout this regulation, the insured is treated like the policyholder. No matter whether it is a group insurance, it could be a simple insurance for the benefit of a third party, no matter whether it is a group insurance where the policyholder has an own commercial interest in its in the accession of group members, or whether it's some other group insurance, it doesn't matter. The individual insured in Brussels IBs is always treated like a policyholder. And the policyholder cannot conclude in principle a jurisdiction clause with the insurer binding the individual insured. So you would always have to make the jurisdiction clause also with the individual insured. And this again goes much for, much beyond what the Court of Justice of the European Union has said in the cases we are discussing. And so this case law will have little impact in term in, in the context of jurisdiction, because there the individual insured is so protected, if not to say overprotected already, that um, it, it's way beyond what the Court of Justice has decided. This is different, very different to the question which law will govern the contract, this assumingly individual insurance contract between the insurer and the group member. Um, Article 7 of the Rome 1 regulation that deals with most of the insurance contracts um, and answers the question which law will apply focuses on the policyholder. It doesn't mention the insured or a group member in a group insurance. So theoretically, if you apply, apply Article 7 from a formal point of view, you could say, well, the insurer and the policyholder, they conclude a group insurance contract, the policyholder is a large risk policyholder, let's say, and he's allowed to choose any kind of law and they do a choice of law and all the insurers will be bound, even if they are probably small uh, risks or even consumer risks. That would be taking Article 7 literally. And my prognosis would be that the Court of Justice will not take Article 7 literally. It will apply the same reasoning. It will say, well, there's its own commercial interest on side of the policyholder to bring in group members because it's charging a commission or getting some other benefit. We'll treat him as an agent and we will treat the individual insured like a policyholder having an individual insurance contract with the insurer. And that means there's a separate contract and the law to be applied to this separate individual contract must be determined independently. And that again means uh, it will be determined with a view to the insured. If now this is a consumer or a small risk, there's no free choice of law. And in any way, the choice of law done by the policyholder with the insurer cannot bind a third party like an insured. This is at least my prognosis. I do not think the European Court of Justice will decide differently in the context of um, uh, group insurance, in the context of private international law. Um, as a consequence, a, one and the same group insurance contract will be treated like many, many different individual, like a group of individual insurance contracts, let me put it this way. And I would suggest that we should think about adjusting Article 7, Rome 1, and maybe allow for some choices of law more in those situations, because even if you want to protect the policyholder or the individual insured, those restrictions are not always just to his favor. Sometimes they play in his disfavor. But I think um, that should be balanced, newly balanced in view of the new case law of the European Court of Justice now. And of course, it was mentioned, I was the chairman of the principle of your, the group drafting the principles of European insurance contract law. We wanted those principles to be an optional instrument, an option for insurers in Europe to opt out of national law and opt exclusively into European insurance contract law, an option in favor of, uh, of principles that were containing detailed rules on group insurance. And that, of course, would make this problem of conflict of law disappear because we would have a uniform set of rules apply and it, 
You could organize group insurances based on the PICL and sell them the same way throughout Europe, no matter where the group members come from. Obviously, I think that would bear an advantage, and so we should probably reconsider this. Um, and I thank you for your attention at this point and give the word back to Oliver for moderating. Thank you very much, Helmut. And I will just pass on the word to Jeff for his presentation. Thank uh, you, terrific. Jeff. Uh, thank you. And um, um, let, can I, I want to get to my screen share if I can, but in order to buy some time on this one, I think I can't because Helmut is sharing still. Um, but I do have a question for Helmut. How widely accepted is the PICL in terms of being incorporated into uh, insurance policies? I don't think this is done. I don't, I'm not aware that 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 you you mean that rules are copied and pasted into insurance contracts. I've heard, or, or, or that there's a choice of law clause choosing yeah. the PICO in but insurance this is, not, this is not possible. Not even in large risk insurance. As long as you stay with state courts litigation, you cannot choose non-state law. This is the pre way prevailing view under European conflict rules, and so you cannot do it this way. What you could do is you could make it terms of the contract and embodied in your contract, but then they would still be, be subsidiary to any national mandatory rules. And uh, they would not do the effect of uniforming the framework. But I have heard that some Japanese insurance companies have sort of redrafted their general contract terms in view of the PICL. And I've heard it from, from experts, it's not gossip. Huh? So I think there was some movement there but I, I've never read them and I would not understand them, of course. I wouldn't even be able to read those Japanese signs. So, I, But I rely on that and there's some movement and occasionally there may be somebody uh, investigating this, but uh, no, this is not happening so far. It would really require action taken by the European legislator to enact it and allow this option without restricting it by mandatory rules of national law. Interesting. As as an American looking at it, uh, uh, I think the PICL is a wonderful mm -hmm. document, and um, I wish it were adhered to more on this side of the Atlantic as well. I think, does Helmut have to exit um, screen share before I'm able to do it, Oliver, as the uh, technical guy here? Um, let's see. I think I can get it now, and let's try it. Um, and give me a second uh, with my um, technical... Uh, limitations here, a function of age, no doubt, as well. Uh, thanks, Helmut, and thank you, everybody. I want to talk a little bit about um, the degree to which there's fragmentation on uh, in the uh, United States on insurance law, um, which is not always a bad thing, but let's talk about the nature of the fragmentation uh, a little bit. And also, <clears throat> you know, I'll try not, to, uh, many of you are going to be familiar with this uh, to begin with, uh, but uh, so I apologize if I'm uh, telling some people things they already know, but let me try to be quick about it and to then discuss the implications uh, in particular. Um, the U.S. Is, um, is, as you know, kind of a more federal system, values local control, et cetera. And, that, and in the United States, insurance law even by support of federal statute is supposed to be primarily the creature of state law. And we have 50 states and several territories. And as a result, and this is always kind of fun when I'm teaching uh, for students, you can take the very same policy language and essentially the same facts of a dispute. And you can find, for example, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts says the words mean X. The Supreme Court of California says the words mean Y. Uh, and so you can get sometimes diametrically opposed interpretations. So some of these areas of, of discord, if you will, or, or inconsistency are on some rather important points where quite a lot of um, 
uh, money is riding on them. So one among these would be allocation of insurer responsibility for so-called long tail injuries where the damages are spread out over years. Uh, what constitutes a lawsuit that has to be defended as opposed to a mere administrative action that might not have to be uh, defended by an insurer in the liability context. Uh, we have uh, two different camps on what happens if an insurer, uh, liability insurer, breaches its duty to defend in about a dozen states or so. If you're the insurer who breached your duty to defend, um, you lose your right to contest coverage. In the other uh, states, a majority, uh, but not necessarily by population, but by number, you can breach the duty to defend as an insurer, and eventually you have to pay. If you're uh, if you're then held to account, you have to reimburse the policyholder for the litigation expenses. But you can still argue about whether there's coverage for the indemnity portion of the claim. Uh, in general, insurance intermediaries, if the um, insurer is a disclosed principal, um, tend to avoid liability in the United States, but not completely. We have about a dozen states where under the uh, requisite circumstances, insurance intermediaries like managing general agents and third-party administrators or brokers can be uh, held responsible for uh, violations of the uh, duty by the insurer. Uh, to the extent that they're uh, um, um, uh, in cahoots, if you will, or in concert with the insurer. We have um, you know, rather dramatic differences on the issue from state to state uh, on whether a liability insurer that has been defending a claim can then try to recoup some of those expenses from the policyholder by arguing that not every claim was covered. Um, some states permit that. The majority of states, I think, correctly say the liability insurance policy in the United States says you defend lawsuits. That means you defend the lawsuit, the entire lawsuit, including both the potentially covered claims and the claims that aren't potentially discovered. The pollution exclusion after all these years, and as many of you know, uh, for many years, there was no pollution exclusion uh, in American insurance policies until about the 1960s. Then for about 10 years, we had the so-called qualified pollution exclusion that said no coverage for pollution unless the discharge of the contaminant is, quote, sudden and accidental. Courts divided about 50-50 on whether those words require the discharge to be abrupt or simply unexpected. And so the insurers adopted an absolute pollution exclusion, which has done a wonderful job of excluding claims for what we might call traditional pollution. But the states and the individual cases within a state are often quite disparate about whether we consider it to be pollution when there's a carbon monoxide leak from a furnace or whether there's uh, spilled uh, chemicals out of a um, photocopying machine or whether there is smoke from burning leaves or uh, my favorite case, bat guano <laughs> in the attic of a homeowner's policy that had uh, a pollution exclusion. Um, and uh, so we have this divergence. And even in an area where there's been quite a lot of uniformity, as many of you know, there's been fairly extensive um, efforts to, by policyholders to obtain coverage for business interruption, business income losses occasioned by COVID-19 related restrictions on their businesses. Mostly insurers have won those cases overwhelmingly making the argument that the COVID virus, either in the air or on surfaces, has not been a sufficiently physical damage or loss to trigger uh, coverage. And so insurers have been winning these cases even when they don't have an express virus exclusion but they haven't won 100% of them. Uh, there's still some variance, uh, and there are a few Supreme Courts, most notably perhaps so far Vermont, that have been uh, uh, more receptive. Nevada recently sided with the insurers. California is still pending. So even in these areas where there's uniformity, uh, we see this sort of division occasioned by what I would call the United States federalism, this decentralized notion we have of both government and law. We have a large national government. 
but there's an awful lot of power and adjudicative authority um, that remains with the states. And we have a very strong cultural tradition here that may or may not vary from uh, different countries in Europe or Latin America about local control and, and a celebration of local control and a concern about over-nationalization. So state courts are typically the front lines of litigation. Uh, when there was briefly some concern that fe federal law across the board would dominate insurance. Congress, the U.S. Congress in 1945 passed the McCarran Ferguson Act that basically says insurance law shall be a matter of state uh, authority unless there's an express um, statement by the federal government that its law preempts the state. So it's a kind of a clear statement rule uh, that otherwise has a default rule in place quite a strong one of the, the states um, having control. At the same time, we have an interesting mix because usually in an insurance coverage dispute, there can be concurrent jurisdiction between the federal, and when I use the word federal in the US, we mean national uh, courts versus the state courts. Um, and even though these federal courts uh, apply to state lines, let me show this map for a minute, which I think is kind of interesting. You'll notice that, uh, and if you really stared closely, you'd see some lines within the states for their district courts. But we never have a national court that encompasses a multi-state metropolitan area. We don't have a federal district court for the uh, metropolitan area of New York. We instead have one for Connecticut, one for New Jersey, one for Southern New York, uh, and then various other components as well. Uh, so there's a real effort to observe state lines and to apply state law. But at the same time, we've created jurisdiction, not only for disputes that involve a national statute, but also for so-called diversity jurisdiction, where the matter in controversy exceeds 75,000, and the disputants are citizens of different states. And by citizenship, we mean domicile. Now, for insurance coverage disputes, that frequently is a ticket to federal court jurisdiction because um, very commonly a policyholder is seeking coverage and the insurer is denying or restricting it. And the insurer will be a citizen of either its state of incorporation or the state of its corporate headquarters. Uh, and that's very often different than the state of the policyholder. For example, a big automobile insurer like State Farm is headquartered in Bloomington, Illinois. Illinois, uh, but it has millions of policyholders spread out all over the United States. So one can easily imagine why 90 odd percent of insurance coverage disputes, including claims handling and bad faith disputes, uh, tend to find their way into federal court. Um, and that's for something I'll talk about in a minute, um, largely because these cases are commenced in the state courts by policyholders, but removed, that's the process we refer to it as under the federal statute. They are removed to federal court at the uh, uh, demand of the insurers who generally prefer the national courts and find them to be more business friendly, more insurer friendly. Uh, on this one little footnote on the state law point, uh, we have a national law that governs employee benefit plans called ERISA, the Employment Retirement Income Security Act. And under ERISA, uh, there has been a, a determination that a general federal common law will govern those states because there's been a striving uh, for consistency. And that general federal common law tends to reflect the baseline contract principles that you might find in the American Law Institute Restatement of Contracts or you might find uh, in the Unidwa principles uh, or um, uh, PIC, uh, PIC rather, and, or PICAL, um, except to the extent that they apply to insurance in some way. Uh, so because of removal, we often have um, the various um, litigation in the federal state courts. Now, the problem with that, or at least some of us think it's a problem, is that the national courts are not authoritative on the meaning of state law. Only the highest court of a particular state is. And because uh, insurers in particular like to remove cases to federal court for so long, you can have an issue litigated for 10, 15, 20 years extensively in the United States 
without having a definitive statement on the interpretive dispute about an insurance policy provision by the relevant state Supreme Court. Uh, and as a result, there's al always a little bit of uncertainty there. There's a pattern perhaps of uh, normally deferring to the first decision or two on the issue among um, similarly situated federal trial judges, but it's not absolute. The federal trial judges will differ. Going back to that map I had a few minutes ago, we can see that there are many appellate courts uh, in the United States, 13 of them, and we can find divisions among the appellate courts uh, when we have appeals to those appellate courts from the federal district court. The U.S. Supreme Court is very unlikely to ever grant certiorari in these cases because it's not really a, a matter of constitutional uh, government organization or civil liberties uh, or First Amendment sort of import. So as a result, you can languish for years before you finally find out what the applicable insurance law is um, uh, in the state of California or the state of Florida regarding a particular uh, controversy on that. And of course, even if your law is defined to be um, or determined, um, it still has a certain amount of um, uncertainty based on the applications of the facts at hand, how they're distinguished from the ruling precedent and the different predilections of judges. A sort of open secret here, although not one that is um, necessarily uh, discussed openly in the U.S., is that judges are different. We don't have a uniform pattern of judicial education or qualification or certification as in many uh, continental countries. And as a result, um, our judges in state court can come from election. They can come from appointment by a governor alone, by a governor with the recommendations of a merit selection panel. And in the national courts, the judges are nominated by the president and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. And we find rather significant, not overwhelming, not, not lawless, but significant and detectable differences, I think, between the judges that are appointed by Republican presidents and those that are appointed by Democratic presidents. The, the latter tend to be um, somewhat more pro-consumer, pro-policy holder in their orientation, but not dramatically. The former, the Republican appointees, are often quite conservative on tort claims, uh, consumer rights claims, insurance coverage claims, and by conservative tending to side uh, with the carrier. So against this uh, mix, uh, we find a significant amount uh, of uh, divergence among the parties here. And so as a result, um, it's a full employment act for American lawyers. There's a lot of procedural skirmishing to get an advantageous um, uh, result. There's a lot of uncertainty that I referred to, and there's a lot of passion dependency. I think this was shown in the COVID-19 litigation where the insurers did a masterful job of both doing a public relations campaign about the economic consequences of having to cover these uh, COVID-19 related losses, but also uh, creating a good path dependency that favored them by picking and choosing their battles in terms of uh, where they would file suit if they sought a declaratory judgment, when they would remove, when they wouldn't remove, when they would make a motion to dismiss when they thought they had a favorable judge who would issue a ruling, refraining from those motions if they did not like the assigned judge or the, the particular venue, and then beginning to get some precedent in their favor, and then marshalling that precedent to convince subsequent courts that we did have emerging authority on the area. And so it was a very uh, successful uh, effort by the insurers in COVID-19. I should also point out that there can be procedural differences between our national courts and our state courts. And as a general rule, the national courts, the federal courts, have um, greater power to dismiss a case at the pleading stage after discovery is taken. They also require a unanimous jury, which makes it harder for the party with the burden of proof, which is generally the policyholder trying to obtain coverage. And you have different uh, jury venues as well because of the larger geographic reach of the uh, federal courts in this particular area. Um, and um, in, in a few instances, 18 states will permit you to ask for a change of judge in state court. If you don't like the initially assigned judge, you don't have that option uh, in federal court. 
So the system is one in which I would argue that the so-called repeat players, the institutional litigants, have a lot of things going in their favor relative to the so-called one-shot players who may only have one or two legal disputes um, in their life, particularly consumers. Businesses will have more, but nobody, nobody has legal disputes like insurers have legal disputes. They're the ultimate repeat player, and I think they have systemic advantages in the United States. And so I mentioned I'm going to skip over these slides here in the interest of time, but there are a number uh, of these uh, instances where we can find states uh, and uh, dire dire diametrically opposed among the states and also diametric opposition and what I would call interstate, where a federal court uh, issues a claim initially um, in this uh, instance here. Um, and then uh, the when the matter is finally judged by a state court, uh, we find that the, the state's Supreme Court disagrees with the national courts, the federal trial courts that have been uh, deciding the issue. Um, there is a, uh, the option of certification. Federal courts can certify an insurance question, insurance law question to the highest court of the state in which the federal court sits. In my opinion, it's an underused um, a tool, uh, underused for, I think, the sociological reasons that federal judges do not like to admit uncertainty. They would like to uh, think that they can decide the case. But if there's not clear precedent of the state court, they have to make what's known as an eerie guess based on a case called Erie versus Tompkins, it says um, federal courts sitting in diversity do have to apply the state law. And that's a particularly strong concept in insurance, even though for the reasons I've just mentioned, it as a practical matter uh, does not play out. So sometimes uh, when you don't get certification, you get further delay in these as well. And I won't talk about the uh, COVID situation, but I, I will raise the issue about whether we have a systemic problem in the United States. Should we, in fact, strive toward a more uniform system, or would that be what Ralph Waldo Emerson might call a foolish consistency? Uh, on one hand, the fragmentation is frustrating for the reasons that I've just detailed. Uh, on the other hand, um, it does respect the idea that there can be uh, local uh, differences of public policy. And channeling the great Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis's observation, states can sometimes be laboratories. So if a given state adopts a certain approach to a particular insurance coverage question and another state adopts an opposite approach, we can watch and see which one works better. Are there fiscal consequences? Are there consumer protection consequences? Are there public policy consequences? And if instead you adopt a national uh, rule right out of the um, uh, at the beginning, you don't get to, uh, if you will, test drive some of the different interpretations and approaches uh, as well. Um, uh, in uh, addition to that, I think the fact that the delay can sometimes be your friend. It can be frustrating, but sometimes the early decisions are not sufficiently informed by full factual development and do not have the uh, degree of reflection necessary to reach the correct results. And there have been a number of instances instances in the U.S. were in, say, some of the mass tort cases, early decisions were are now regarded as having been wrongly decided. And those approaches by the early courts were ultimately corrected as we gained greater knowledge about the, um, about the uh, nature of the spread of a disease or drugs or particular uh, documents that had been uh, not had been had not been on earth during the early stages of litigation. Um, but at the same time, uh, when you have this problem of removal uh, and disparate uh, notions and disparate bench, uh, you do have the inconsistency and the procedural opportunism uh, that's presented by it. So one possible fix, but controversial, I suppose, um, if I were king of the world, I would think seriously about uh, removing removal jurisdiction. It's based on the notion that you have to have the national court available because of potential local prejudice against non-citizen, non-resident defendants. But this is a country that has um, uh, made a, um, a killing with uh, nationalized, homogenized brands, McDonald's, Burger King. Um, Amazon that, that everybody has. I think that we jurisdiction 
uh, removal jurisdiction and diversity jurisdiction has outlived its usefulness on this. So uh, as a result, um, we should probably get rid of it, but there are very powerful forces that want to keep it, uh, particularly the repeat players in corporate America who've learned to use removal jurisdiction uh, to its advantage. And so with that, I uh, thank folks and I'll turn it back over to Oliver for our next presentation. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, some of you have already heard Francisca's presentation. Um, so that they can leave, we would now first take questions on the first three presentations, on the presentations of Manuela, Helmut and Jeff. And after those questions have been dealt with, we would go over to Francisca and her presentation. Um, I would like to show you a question that um, appear in the Q&A section. I have copied it into a PowerPoint um, slide. Give me a second. Okay. So I will not do that. Maybe I have privacy issues. The computer doesn't want me to show you my slides, unfortunately. But can you all go to the Q&A sections and do you see the questions that have been posed there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Can everybody do that? Also the, um, the audience. Then now I would um, read Tyne Murr's question. It is a long one and I hope I will be able to do that. It's addressed to Manuela. He asks, did I understand correctly that on your slide number 14, you say that there is no economic interest when the remuneration merely finances the premium? If so, is this not contradicted by the, C, um, the Court of Justice says in recital 42 of TC Medical Air Ambulance Agency? And now the quote of the case in view of the broad interpretation of the concept of remuneration it is irrelevant that the payment with each membership of the group insurance policy to the legal person which subscribe to that contract with the insurance company is made by the members in return for rights to the insurance benefits transferred to them by the person by that person and not by the insurer in the form for example of a commission Moreover, that fact does not call into question that person's own economic interest in the broadest possible membership um, of its customers to that contract so that those various payments finance or exceed the amount of the premium which it itself pays to the insurer under the same contract. And he then adds, because this recital seems to indicate that the remuneration, the payment that finances the amount of premium is already a remuneration under the IMD and the IDD. Um, yes, I think it's necessary that the policyholder receives any amount which stays with him. So he has to have an economic foretile in any case. And when the person insured only pays an amount, which is the premium one by one and is forwarded to the um, insurer, I guess there is no financial advantage. But the following up question would be if the policyholder would have maybe another kind of financial or non-financial advantage may be when the uh, person insured has to join the association, maybe yeah, as, as example, of the policyholder and therefore he receives a membership for the association or something like this, then we can also have a kind of advantage. But in the case where is not, not even any mini advantage at all, I don't see that the it's fulfilled to be qualified as an intermediary. Oliver, we couldn't hear you. Sorry for that. Okay, thank you very much, Manuela. 
um, you can interfere, raise your hand and we can um, let you talk orally. And if you don't do that, we would just go to the next question, which is addressed to Helmut. It states, I understand your prognosis for the application of Rome 1 to group insurance contracts for voluntary adherence, i.e. that the contracts will be treated like multiple individual contracts. But what would then be the reasoning to not apply this to, for example, group hospitalization policies taken out by employers? In such a policy, there is no voluntary adherence, and I understand that your prognosis would not apply. But how is this fair to insured employees under a hospitalization policy taken out by an employer with employees located in different member states working for branches, not subsidiaries of the employer policyholder? And what is the legal reasoning for not qualifying these insureds as functional policyholders? question thank is addressed you. to Helmut. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. And of course, it's a crucial question. And it is exactly in this dividing line of how far should we go with protecting the individual insurers of group insurances. I've mentioned the example of Brussels IBs. Brussels IBs doesn't ask any question that the insured is always treated like a policyholder. Um, and, and this way, we don't ask whether it's elective group insurance or automatic group insurance and so on. Whereas Article 7, Rome 1 focuses on the policyholder. And um, <clears throat> the legal reasoning would be that under regular circumstances, imagine a case where you have a um, insurance for the benefit of a third party uh, taken out by a policyholder uh, habit with a habitual residence in one country, one member state, and a beneficiary or, or an insured in another member state we would still only look at the policyholder as the decisive figure um, doing the choice and also the choice of law as far as it is possible under Article 7, Rome 1, and the insured would be bound by this. Um, now, if we intervene with this structure, um, we have to intervene with some reason, and the European Court of Justice has intervened by saying if an insured is exceeding a group, the choice is basically the same like taking out insurance. And this is why this insured needs information like somebody who is a policyholder. And I think you can carry this reasoning further and treat this insured like a policyholder in general, and then also give him a choice of law under Article 7 of Rome 1. If you apply this reasoning in that you compare the functional acting of an insured is a policyholder that would not apply to a uh, automatic re, um, automatic um, group insurance, where I am an employee of employer B, and uh, employer B has a uh, some factory is from Germany, for instance, but has some factories in in France, and I work for this factory, and I am the beneficiary insured under a policy that is taken out by my employer in Germany. Um, I have no choice to do. I cannot even say I'm not a member of the group. All I can do is when an insured event occurs, I could say I'm not taking the money. Of course, I can reject uh, the benefits in when, they, when I have a claim to them, which most likely I will not do. So since I have no decision to make, I'm not... Um, I'm not compared to be compared with a policyholder who does choice to enter the contract or no, and alter the contract and so on and so on, and finance the contract also. Um, and that makes a difference to me, but I nevertheless agree that we could argue that when a sufficient part of the risk is located in another member state and many, many insureds are located there, then they should be protected by their home law and split up an automatic group insurance contract as well. Yes, you can argue for matters of legal policy this way, but you cannot argue with the argument taken by the European Court of Justice because he, the, it, it compared the insured by their functional uh, appearance as policyholders taking out insurance. Joining a group is the same thing like taking out insurance. This is a, how I look at these cases. They do, it, the court doesn't just say anybody who is insured under a third party beneficiary insurance or some group insurance needs protection. So as long as we go with the court of justice, I don't think this will apply. 
But as a matter of lady policy, you can, of course, claim that I have uh, done proposals on, on, on the conflict of law rules, how they should be changed on Article 7. I have gone similar ways, which I'm to a certain extent reconsidering now in the light of the court of the case law. But I was a pretty bit much some, to a certain extent in line with you. What I would have done then, I would have allowed these employees to choose the law of the employer. Because if I work for a German company, um, why not? A lot of my uh, employment related legal situation will be somehow related with Germany also. And so maybe um, maybe I would allow this, this um, choice of German law, at least where they are not working in the place where they live, but they are coming borders. Uh, when they work daily in Germany, then I certainly would not restrict the choice of law anymore. But this goes very far because it's it's legal policy. I, I agree that you can make this argument, but I do not think that you have a um, an argument that comes out of the case law of the European Court of Justice. Okay, thank you, Helmut. There is another question by Caroline. It's also addressed to you, Helmut, and it reads, the cases in which the Court of Justice of the European Union has decided all deal with voluntary group insurance. This contradicts the aim and the advantage of group insurance. Would there be an argument to extend the decision of the court to compulsory group insurance? This could be the end of group insurance. You are um, you're muted. Yes, I'm just rereading it so that I get the grasp of it. <clears throat> well, um, I I would certainly agree. I'm, maybe I'm not answering in in the very last detail to this question, but I would certainly agree that from the point of the insurers, um, many advantages of group insurance disappear or are severely limited by this case law now. I nevertheless think that when an insured finances this group insurance and exceeds the group insurance by a own declaration of intention to, to join, uh, it's, it's a correct outcome. But I, I agree with you, Caroline, that this is severely limiting the attractiveness of, of a compulsory regime to a uh, for, for, for insurers um, because it's taking away some of the cost-effective uh, advantages of insurance. Now, when it's compulsory group insurance, um, um, with compulsory group insurance, I'm not sure exactly what you mean there. Um, if you mean that I'm compulsorily insured as a group member, my, my employer takes out the insurance and I expend it to, and, and my employees are insured, whether they are in Germany, in Belgium, or somewhere else, um, and they cannot refuse accession to the group. Uh, if this is what is meant here, then I would agree. It makes it less attractive, far less attractive. And uh, and I think we should consider that when we weigh the legal policy of, of extending this, what I've just uh, said before. And this is also why I'm reconsidering my earlier proposals on a redoing of Article 7, Rome 1. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you mean compulsory insurance in that, uh, like an insurance, like a motor vehicle liability insurance that must be taken out by the by the operator of a car, um, because they are, I mean, it would be compulsory anyhow, so you would have to enter it no matter why, how the, the, the overall regime is handled. So, but if you mean automatic, well, what I what we call in Michael automatic uh, um, group insurance, then I would say, yes, this is a, um, this is a limitation of the attractiveness of the, of the whole product, clearly. Okay, thank you, Helmut. Are there any more questions from the audience? You can also raise your hands and we can um, give you the opportunity to, to speak instead of writing it down. 
Oh, now Caroline has responded and she says, no, I mean automatic. You answered also part of the question in your previous answer. Okay, perfect. Is, is there any, are there any more questions? If not, we will, we will go um, over to our next presentation by Francisca Arnold Dwyer. She will speak about the UK insurance regulatory regime post Brexit and ask the question, Quo Vadis. Thank you for the presentation, Francisca. Word thank is yours. you, Oliver, and uh, thank you, Helmut, uh, Jeff, and Manuela, for your interesting presentations. Now, first of all, those of you who already listened to my presentation earlier this afternoon, uh, please feel free to drop off. Uh, personally, I'm comforted by that um, Taylor Swift is doing the same set list in her era concerts every night, so I'm not above repeating myself. So um, with that, um, we come to our uh, last stop, uh, which is um, London. And uh, as um, Oliver said, um, I want to examine um, what has happened uh, in the insurance regulatory landscape here in the UK post-Brexit. Now, it's um, more than three years ago that um, the big divorce happened, so the uh, UK leaving the European Union. And um, therefore, I thought it might be of interest uh, to those of you who uh, don't live in the UK to get a flavor of um, some of these sort of developments uh, as regards insurance regulations. Um, so let's start by um, a quick reminder of um, the story so far. So in 2016, there was a referendum where the population of the UK was asked whether they wanted to leave or remain um, in the EU. And nearly 52% voted in favor of leaving. Um, this referendum was then followed by sort of a lengthy period um, of first war where the um, UK negotiated, not just with the EU, but also internally, there were lots of discussions about the terms on which um, the UK should be leaving and what the future relationship with the EU should be. Um, eventually, that uh, resulted in an agreement, uh, the full title is the Agreement on the Withdrawal of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland from the European Union and the European Atomic Energy Community. That um, agreement entered into force on 31st of January 2020. Um, but even then, the UK had not fully left. There was a transition period until the end of 2020. And eventually, um, in 21, uh, on 1st of May 21, uh, an agreement uh, entered into force, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which is the current legal instrument that governs the relationship between the UK and uh, the EU. Now, part of being an EU member state is that you're sharing into a big body of EU law with the other member states. So for us as lawyers, um, the question is, well, what happened to that EU law um, in the UK? And it's been estimated that there are about so 20,000 pieces of EU legislation. And um, how do you deal with that overnight? Well, first of all, um, in the transition period, so until the end of 2020, EU law remained in force. And then uh, what happened after depended on the type of uh, EU instrument. So one um, so of the two major types are EU directives and EU regulations. And just very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with EU law, EU directives are um, pieces of legislation addressed to the governments of the member states, and they then have to implement that directive into their domestic law. And uh, of course, where the, where the um, uh, law was EU directive based, it was already implemented into UK law. So it, it remains in force unless it's going to be appealed or amended. Now, uh, in contrast, EU regulations are EU instruments that um, apply with direct effect. So nothing else needs to be done. Uh, they they sort of come into uh, force and they um, apply directly in the member states. Now, after Brexit, these EU regulations would have ceased to be applicable. 
but just letting them lapse would have created a legal uh, sort of vacuum. And therefore, the um, UK government uh, decided uh, to do sort of this massive onshoring exercise, basically bringing into um, the UK domestic law these EU regulations. And the legal instrument that achieved that was the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, 2018, as later amended by the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. Uh, EU case law is also no longer binding on UK courts. And that leaves us with a situation where we have this body of uh, retained uh, EU law, which has become part of domestic law, but it's not the current uh, EU law. It's the EU law as it was on 31st of December 2020. Now, bizarrely, um, this uh, is of now creating a situation where we have this sort of time capsule based um, retained uh, EU law. And uh, if you look at this picture, so we've got a fog in the road until 31st of December 2020. We, we had the same law uh, in financial services as the EU. But now um, the UK is implementing uh, certain reforms in financial services. So it's devel developing into one direction. But at the same time, uh, the EU law hasn't uh, uh, stood still. So in the, in the insurance regulation space, uh, we've got certain developments, um, sort of amendments to the Solvency II regime, uh, proposals to make amendments to the insurance uh, distribution directive. And um, there is also a proposal for an insurance recovery and resolution directive. Um, so um, uh, this means that the, even the UK retained EU law is not necessarily um, the same or consistent with the current um, EU law in the insurance uh, regulation space and, and also in other areas. So now what is it? that the UK government wants to achieve with their uh, financial services reforms. Um, well, that's very clear. Um, they um, want to um, put in place uh, a domestic uh, regulatory framework, which is geared towards um, growth and competitiveness. So by adjusting the regulatory framework, they want to make the um, UK an attractive marketplace for financial services or sort of um, expressed in more populist terms by our Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. He said, we want to seize on our Brexit freedoms to deliver an agile and homegrown regulatory system regime that works in the interest of British people and our businesses. Um, so essentially the sentiment is that um, when you think about uh, EU-based uh, insurance regulation, so the two directive, uh, it was negotiated um, uh, sort of one fits all instrument for all um, member states. So it wasn't particularly suited, and so the UK argues it wasn't particularly uh, suited to the UK, which is slightly um, rewriting history uh, because um, the UK at the time was sort of one of the drivers of solvency too. So a lot of, of its sort of previous regulatory system actually fed into uh, the structure of the solvency two directive. Now, um, what do these uh, reforms look like? Well, the centerpiece of the uh, financial services reforms are the, finan the Financial Services and Markets Act 2023. Uh, it uh, received the royal assent from our uh, new King Charles III in uh, June. Uh, and, uh, but uh, even so, it's now on the statute book, not all parts have come in, into force yet. Now, these of key provisions of, of this act are that the uh, two regulators in the financial services arena, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, and the PIA, the Prudential Regulation Authority, are being given um, a lot um, of new powers. Um, and they've also got an additional mandate. Uh, so it's no longer just the case that they have to um, safeguard the integrity of the financial markets and protect consumers and um, and and these of these uh, sort of usual regulatory objectives. In addition, they now have a regulatory job objective to facilitate growth and the international competitiveness of the UK economy. They also have to take into account uh, the UK's net zero targets. 
and uh, sort of a number of other environmental goals. And um, the Act also sets out the framework for the sort of gradual uh, revocation of retained EU law and financial services that's still in place. Um, and then there's sort of uh, specific um, uh, regulatory powers um, uh, of which I just want to mention uh, the uh, financial promotions provisions, um, which is an innovation um, because it's relevant to insurance. And basically, uh, under these new provisions, um, uh, an authorized firm like an, an insurer needs to get the permission from the regulator first to approve any financial promotions of an unauthorized firm. So if you're using an agent uh, to sell insurance products, which itself is not authorized, you need to have this process um, uh, sort of um, the consent from the regulator first to do that. Um, the other parts of the reform package are the, um, insurer, resol uh, the insurer resolution regime, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, a major part is the insurance solvency reforms. And uh, then there is sort of a residual um, element, uh, the so-called Edinburgh reforms, named after the place where they were first published. And again, this is a sort of a wider package of reform measures. Some of uh, them have already fed into the Financial Services Markets Act, um, and some are sort of a more sort of midterm program for, for changes uh, to financial services. Uh, so the one that's um, perhaps most relevant to insurance is uh, sort of to make changes uh, to the PRIPS regime. So, and then moving on to the um, insurer resolution regime. Um, so the current status of, of, um, of this is that uh, we've had uh, proposals uh, from the Treasury uh, in, in January, there was a consultation period. But since then, um, this particular reform project has gone a little bit quiet. So there's no, um, no timetable of um, uh, when and how it's going to be implemented. But the purpose of uh, this insurer resolution regime is to provide the regulators with additional tools to manage sort of the financial difficulties or the financial failure of insurers and reinsurers in a sort of in an orderly manner uh, in order to prevent a uh, sort of wider impact on the financial system and policyholders. So it's really um, uh, a regime uh, with, um, with tools for the regulator uh, in relation to um, insurers that have sort of a systemic um, impact. Now, I don't want to go into the um, detail of it, but what I do want to say is that this is one of the areas where we have parallel developments uh, to the EU, because the EU itself has put forward proposals for an insurance recovery and resolution directive. Um, and between the two regimes, there are obviously uh, commonalities, there is overlap, um, but there are also differences. So it's an example of um, our fork in the road, uh, where the UK is going one way and the EU is going another. Um, then uh, for um, solvency two, uh, here the um, Treasury and the PIA are both active, and um, there are proposals um, relating specifically to the um, solvency capital calculations, and then there are also proposals that are um, uh, to do with the authorization and supervision um, of insurance companies more widely. Now, on the um, uh, solvency capital side, the um, two major points are um, the proposals uh, that have been made uh, to lower the risk margin. So if you look in my solvency to balance sheet here, on the um, right hand side, we've got the liability side and the orange and the red bit together, there are the technical provisions. So this is sort of the um, uh, the amount the insurer has to uh, to keep in assets to cover, first of all, the best estimate of liabilities, so what, he, what the insurer is ex expecting in terms of uh, insurance liabilities claims. But there's also an additional buffer in light orange here, which is called the risk margin. So um, one of the proposals aims at reducing the risk margin. Um, 
which obviously has the end result of uh, that the uh, insurer has to keep uh, less technical provisions matched by assets, so it's freeing up capital. Um, same as matching adjustments, uh, the matching um, adjustments, um, they are sort of, um, sort of a mechanism that allows insurers to discount long-term liabilities um, at a sort of more favorable rate than uh, these sort of usual uh, risk-free rate. Uh, so again, by um, applying this matching adjustment, um, you're sort of reducing this element here, you're freeing up capital, which is great for in insurers because they have to keep this capital, this capital becomes available, and uh, the UK government hopes that this um, extra of free up capital uh, is being used for green investments, but there's no sort of tie up, there's no obligation for insurers uh, that they have to invest it in green investments. So it's it's um it's an aspiration rather than um, a prescription. Um, again, uh, we've got parallel developments uh, in the EU. We've had an EU Solvency II review, and there are certain sort of proposals for amending the Solvency II directive, including on the calculation side. Now, then on the sort of um, uh, supervision and authorization uh, side, um, the proposals that the PII, PII has put forward, um, they are all sort of geared at simplification, more flexibility, and encouraging entry for new. Um, market entrance. Um, so it's it sort of comes down to um, uh, simplified processes, uh, fewer reporting obligations, uh, more proportionate regulation, and um, sort of making it easy for for new entrants um, to establish um, uh, sort of an insurance business in the UK. So it doesn't just apply to new firms. It also applies um, to um, firms from abroad uh, that want to set up, say, a branch or a subsidiary in the UK. So the PIA is, is signaling that they welcome the operation of international insurers in the UK. And you can see how this fits in with that overall um, sort of landscape um, that the UK government wants to create in sort of making the UK an attractive marketplace for insurance business. Now, having heard all this, you, you probably think that that's all great uh, for insurers, but what about um, ensuring um, financial stability and protecting uh, consumers? Um, well, the PAA, with all these proposals, the PAA has always been sort of making all the noises of yes, and whilst we're relaxing this and whilst we're making um, things more flexible, we are, we do want to uh, retain robust and um, sort of strict uh, regulation, um, but uh, you can uh, judge for yourself how this fits with um, uh, what, what the actual proposals are. Um, as regards consumers, um, there is um, a new development, um, which is not um, sort of directly part of the uh, Brexit um, packages. But it's so very much in line uh, with this idea of creating more uh, principle-based and flexible regulation. It's a new consumer duty, um, which um, is uh, going to apply to all regulated financial products, so including insurance products, and all firms in the distribution chain. So not just the um, in insurer, but also um, uh, sort of distributors and potentially um, other firms that are some, somewhere active in the distribution chain, for example, claims handlers. And uh, they all have to um, comply with a new consumer principle, which requires firms to act to deliver good outcomes for retail customers. And retail customers are consumers and small and medium-sized entities when they're not acting as part of their own trade. And um, supplementing uh, this very broad principle are uh, three cross-cutting rules, which require firms to act in good faith towards retail customers. And this is quite significant because there is no general principle of good faith um, in um, English contract law. Insurance contracts have always been an um, exception, 
Um, but for other contracts uh, in the financial services space, um, this good faith requirement is going to be an innovation. Um, second rule is to avoid causing foreseeable harm and retail, uh, to retail customers. And thirdly, to enable them and support them to pursue their financial objectives. And uh, these rules, the consumer principle and the rules, they have to um, also um, be implemented in relation to four outcomes, products and services, uh, price and value, consumer understanding, and consumer support. Um, but, and then what are the sort of sanctions or remedies uh, if um, an insurer or if somebody, if say a, a customer feels um, that um, he or she hasn't uh, received a good outcome and a good outcome, well, the expectation is that uh, the, um, um, the firms, so including insurers, have in place um, procedures um, which um, deal with complaints and offer remedial action, um, which is not always compensation, could just be an apology or some other form of redress. Um, there could also be regulatory enforcement action. Um, but uh, for the breach, for an alleged breach of that principle, there would not be any sort of direct um, action for damages um, because it's it's a principle, it's, it's not a rule. Um, and um, uh, these, uh, this new consumer duty is already has already been enforced for new financial products uh, since end of July and needs to be um, applied to all existing uh, regulated financial products uh, by the end of July next year. And then uh, just very briefly um, on equivalence. So equivalence is the idea of um, one uh, legal or regulatory system recognizing uh, the regulatory system of another country as um, equally good or robust. Um, now that the UK is no longer an EU member state, no longer bound by the EU solvency two regime, the UK is treated um, as a third country for um, solvency two purposes. The solvency two directive has mechanisms for um, uh, equivalence uh, in three areas, reinsurance, uh, the solvency calculation and group supervision, um, but no equivalence determination has been made yet by the uh, EU as regards the UK solvency system. And the reason is um, that uh, the European Commission advised by EOPA um, just sort of, sort of sit tight and wait and see how the um, UK reforms are going to, to play out. Um, if they make a negative determination, there's nothing the UK can, can do about it, not being a, a member state, they cannot challenge uh, that decision in judicial proceedings. Um, on the other hand, and again, you can see um, what the UK government is doing here. The UK has given equivalence uh, to the um, EU Solvency II regime. And of course, this plays well with the idea of wanting to create an attractive marketplace. Um, just a few weeks ago, the PIA has also um, published a new consultation paper uh, on its approach to the authorization and supervision of insurance branches. So insurance companies from abroad doing business in the UK. Uh, this consultation is currently open. So if you're acting uh, for an insurance company from abroad and you're thinking about um, uh, so setting up in, in the UK, uh, maybe this is something you should uh, read and uh, may, maybe make your voice heard in, in this consultation. So. Um, this was a very sort of quick and dirty overview. I've um, given you sort of a list of, of the key sources I've referred to, uh, but I'm also open to questions now, but also um, after the, the session, and you can contact me um, at my email address, uh, which you can also find on the Queen Mary website. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Francisca, for that presentation. Um, the second time. <laughs> so does anyone have questions for Francisca? You can still raise your hands and um, pose your questions orally or type them into the Q&A section if you want.
Yes. Well, I have a small question, but it is um, a rather simple one. Um, I hope is... so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, um, a simple minded one. I, that's what I mean. <laughs> um, not a simple question. Uh, you said that the UK or England is trying to, um, to become a good marketplace, mm -hmm. attractive for insurers, um, and they free up capitals for insurers, um, reduce the capital requirements. And then you, the next slide was, and what about the normal people who take insurance? Are mm -hmm. they less protected in, in your view? than they were before with this flexible system that is not specifically um, tailored to insurance? Well, if, um, on, a, on a macro level, I would say, yes, they are less well protected because that's the logical conclusion you have to draw from an insurance company having um, less regulatory capital. The PIA would probably argue that um, uh, the previous or the, the current requirements under the um, Solvency II regime are overprotective because they are um, sort of a one size fits all sort of solution. Um, it, it, so it, it includes um, capital layers that are not necessarily needed uh, for ensuring uh, the stability of, of that um, insurer and the protection of, of the policyholders. Okay, and you said that the EU is going to mm -hmm. um, to amend their own legislation, the Solvency II regulation, as well in the same direction. So, or... um, yeah, so I'm, I, I feel I'm sort of talking without a last year, but as I understand it, the uh, Solvency II um, uh, directive amendments. Um, so the ones I have looked at in more detail, they're actually concerned with um, amending solvency to um, uh, to take into account um, sort of climate risk. So it's um, it's uh, for um, for the solvency two calculation uh, to also incorporate not just of the twelve months in advance, but also to take a longer term view of what else of the future financial impacts uh, on an insurance company as for example from climate change so this is one example where um, the solvency two uh, directive is actually going to be more um, tighter and and um, holding insurers more accountable rather than relaxing the capital requirements okay mm -hmm. thank you very much are there any other questions for Francisca? That does not seem to be the case. Um, and then I would like to give, to hand over the word to Christoph for some um, closing remarks. Thank you, Oliver. First of all, Francisca, I already had the chance to, to ask my questions, so I... I figured I shouldn't ask the same question again, and you. Yeah, maybe I would have given a different again. answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, just allow for one brief comment, maybe. Um, Jeff, when you were talking about the interstate differences between the insurance laws and plural in the United States, um, you were mentioning Louis Brandeis, right? And you were talking about, you know, th this idea of a laboratory of democracy, you know, one single courageous state may serve as a laboratory and, you know, try novel, novel experiments, social experiments, if, if, if the citizens of the state so choose and that or that without risk for the rest of the country. That is the idea, right? And and. and I mean, you were like basically making the case for 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 federalism, and and I was wondering whether you were also making the case for Brexit, because in <laughs> Europe now, now we we have you know we have the chance to 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 observe what what Great Britain is doing after the Brexit, and I mean reducing the the, the risk margins certainly is risky, and we might just be able to watch whether that is a good idea. 
and uh, I, I don't know. I, it, it, it's, it seems to be uh, risky, but of course, no, nobody really knows. Um, so, so, so is that is, is that maybe yeah, an advantage and, and, of Brexit? And, and for the record, where I where, where I planted in London in 2016, I would have been a remainder. Um, but uh, because you know there is on one hand the gains from diversification or or experimentation versus the efficiencies of collectivism in uniformity. And um, and just to give you a quick follow up before I actually respond, you know in the U.S. for example, uh, Massachusetts passed what became kind of what we now call Obamacare in the United States. Again, I'm not sure if that's the best idea. Something like a single payer system might be better, but that's, a, I think, a pretty good recent example of where something that happened in the States sort of caught on, at least among reformers who didn't think they had the political clout to get single payer. Um, and I think it is interesting. I, I think you have a great national natural experiment there unless there are things I'm missing about the nature of the business uh, being different on that. And it will be interesting to see. I suspect there's some trepidation, as you've expressed, that if you're going to experiment in anything, maybe um, capital margins and solvency is not the way you want to uh, experiment, because if something goes wrong, it could be much different than whether you're experimenting with different claims handling laws. But but let me just follow up real quickly, if I can, Christoph, and this is sort of for the others as well. Um, given at least my trial hypothesis that it matters a lot who your case gets assigned to in an American state or in an American federal court. When I look at these consumer protection rules that have been outlined, I think they actually look pretty good. But being the cynic I am, I think, yes, but it all depends on who's enforcing them. And And I guess I'm curious as to your confidence in the consumer orientation of the adjudicators and within something like the FCA, I have to betray my ignorance. Do you get different panels? Do you get differentiation? Or are these entities, uh, and similarly with the courts and the more uniform judicial training of the continent and um, the UK, are the results more uniform than they would be in a place like the United States where, um, you know, let me be brutally honest, if if you tell me the nature of the case and who it's been assigned to among the dozen federal national judges we have in Las Vegas, I can make a pretty good prediction of what the outcome will be, at least at the motion stage. If it gets to a jury, of course, um, those are 12 lay people or eight lay people, and who knows what's going to happen. But but the judges have definitely individual and distinctive orientations toward particular areas of the law. Same in Europe, or have you solved the consistency problem? Yeah, so in, um, in the uh, UK for financial services uh, matters, so we've got there's sort of two different things. We've got uh, the FCA with its enforcement arm, um, which will um, uh, be sort of have the capacity uh, to implement um, uh, sort of interventions, uh, sort of uh, imposing sanctions. Um, but there's also something called uh, the financial ombudsman, which is um, sort of an um, outside the court system, uh, sort of an adjudication scheme for consumer financial services complaints. Mm -hmm. And um, the sort of, um, sort of not unusual, but the uh, sort of one of the features of that uh, regime is that um, uh, it doesn't have to adhere uh, to black letter law, it can take into into consideration uh, sort of you know sort of equity um, equitable considerations. So there is there is a degree of um, flexibility, which of course can lead to to inconsistent outcomes. Yeah, I don't even know if I want to add anything to that. I mean, we also have different players. Obviously, there's the lawmaker in a civil law system but there is also an ombudsman we do have that in germany as well and we have the courts again which will decide in individual cases so there is some diversity too but i wouldn't go as far as saying that i would know um which judge to go in order to get a certain judgment okay i, I don't think that is quite as distinctive as it obviously is in the united states so i'd be a lot more careful and, and so far 
Okay, but still, ladies and gentlemen, Oliver asked me for closing remarks and not for another discussion on <laughs> the general pros and cons of a federal or non-federal state system. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, especially Francisca, for doing your presentation twice. It was a pleasure to listen to you. If you do it ever again, <laughs> just give me a call. I'll, I'll, I'll be listening again. So thank you very much. And um, well, thank you to the audience, to the other speakers. And um, have a nice evening or, uh, I don't know, Jeff, a, a nice day probably, uh, depending on uh, your time zone. And uh, I hope we'll meet you again. Um, I have the uh, invitation to the next lecture right in front of me. There's going to be a lecture in spring 2024 on insurance and climate change. So if you wanted to, you could all uh, you could already save the dates. Uh, it's March 14th, and um, <laughs> I hope the time is right. It's going to be 3 p.m. <laughs> Central European time. <laughs> uh, at least according to our invitation, but uh, maybe you wanted to check again before uh, you dive in next time. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, as I've said before, goodbye. Have a nice evening.